Hello, my name is Max Moskowitz, and this is my podcast, Fighting with Moskowitz, or in Dutch, Vechten met Moskowitz. We're making a whole edition about the UAP phenomena for Nieuwe Revue magazine, which is a Dutch magazine. And today we are talking to a uh, former man in charge of the AA tip program uh, for the Pentagon, Mr. Louis Elizondo. Uh, he was a, a former Secret Service guy, he was chasing terrorists. He was in charge of investigating UFOs, UAPs, and everything surrounding that subject. You might hear some really new things uh, about the UAP phenomena and what we can expect in the future. Three years ago, the, the, the Pentagon released these images, and you must get this question a lot. I understand that it was actually uh, you who uh, decided to uh, release those images. Is that true? Out front now, the former Pentagon military official who ran the covert government program up until this last November, Luis Elizondo. Luis, thank you so much for your time tonight. I mean, first, tell us what the purpose of the program was and why it was so secretive. Sure. Um, the purpose of the program, uh, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, was really designed to do just that. To some degree, that is true. Uh, it was actually a mutual decision inside my office. Uh, because I was the senior ranking person at the time, obviously the responsibility fell to me and the request was initiated by me. Uh, but it was a mutual decision by, by all of us inside the ATIP program at the time to try to establish a, a, a repository, a library, if you will, at the unclassified level that would allow uh, some of the, the scientific minds outside of the Department of Defense to maybe look at some of these videos and help us determine what they are. Um, from a national security perspective, identify those things that we see, whether uh, we see them electro-optically, we see them with radar, we see them uh, as, uh, as eyewitness reports, um, through a myriad of different ways and avenues that we receive the information and try to ascertain and determine if that information is a potential threat to national security. As I began to learn more about the portfolio and see a lot of the evidence, I began to realize that the evidence was very compelling uh, and that the topic was very real. Keep in mind that my background as a, as a special agent was very much, uh, in my country, we call it just the facts, ma'am. Uh, what, what's so compelling to me is that you have highly trained observers, pilots, that we spend literally, literally millions of dollars each year in training these individuals. Some of them go to the very best schools like Top Gun. And in fact, I'll show something. I'll share something with you and your audience here. Please. This is, so this is a profile. These are our U.S. government cards on identifying foreign military aircraft. And you have to be able to identify these aircraft from all different angles, from all different sides, all different perspectives. And that's why our pilots and those also in your country are able to identify a SU-22 versus a MiG-25 versus an F-16 you know, when you have a pilot reporting something that they've never seen before that can outperform anything that we have, which is further substantiated by, by video evidence, gun camera footage, which is then further... Uh, validated by radar data, and by the way, not just one radar, multiple radars in different locations, you now have three separate collection sensor units, the human being being one of them, three collection sensor units, you have radar, cameras, and pilots, all reporting the same thing at the same time, at the same location, under the same circumstances. So if this were to be a, a, a court of law, uh, we would, in, from our perspective, be well beyond reasonable doubt. We, the jury would have to convict. This is, this is a real thing operating in, in real space and time. Um, and that, for me, I think was probably the most compelling because what we were seeing was the technology was, was sufficiently advanced beyond our, our, our current, not only our current capabilities, but our current understanding of aerodynamics and physics. Uh, so the, what you are looking at is facts, right? So you have, okay, they were observed with senses, with eyes, ears. Then you have data, you know, uh, so what pops up on the radar, satellite, um, and camera. Is there also signals you can trace? That is a great 
question. Great question. Uh, unfortunately, I have to be very careful what I say here. What you're referring to is what we call signatures collection. The, the collection of data resulting from an object moving through space and time, whether it's electronic signature or it's a physical signature like heat ablation or atmospheric ionization or acoustic signatures like sonic booms, those are all things that we consider. Uh, unfortunately, I can't go into a lot of detail on those. Uh, but yes, that is certainly very relevant. Um, having more collection sensors with more capability to collect the data is obviously going to give you a more compelling picture of what's going on. Yeah. Um, I can't, again, comment specifically what type of sensors we might or might not have used, but, but you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, part of the and, key here. And, and if I would just throw out a word, gravity. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a good one for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's, um, very very relevant i'll leave it at that but you're that's uh yep you're you're out you're you're obviously tracking <laughs> thank you sir thank you did you have access to the files before you maybe the files decades before you no we we did not uh it was very much a a, a current up op what we call current operational picture our focus was really twofold very simple mission what is it and how does it work uh, we weren't interested in origins or who's behind the wheel or intent at that point. But we we're just trying to identify what are these objects and how do they work. Um, as for us, we did not have the historical documents. Uh, we were aware of them, but we did not necessarily have access, nor did we use them. Because really, our job was to provide a current threat picture for our leadership as to what these things are. So... When when you focus on, on on current cases, aren't you weren't you uh, curious uh, 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 about what what your predecessors correct predecessors? Sorry, it's, when it's late, my English just drops a little bit. Um, okay. So predecessors, um, weren't you curious what what their data was, what they picked up on? Well, sure, but at the time, the only predecessors we were really aware of were those part of Project Blue Book. And that had closed decades and decades before we had started our program. Between Blue Book and uh, uh, AATIP, there were, of course, uh, secrets. Now, now we know that, correct. Now, now yeah. we know that there were some efforts ongoing. But at the time when I was at AATIP, we, we were not, I certainly was not privy to that. I think a lot of people presumed that was the case. But again, we were very much focused on the here and now. And it wasn't until later that I had it confirmed to me that there were or some other efforts in the past uh, after Blue Book, but before our program. And and were there agencies you know of uh, uh, operating uh, parallel to AATIP? You know, maybe you know other organizations no. you were not communicating with. Not that we were aware of. And to this day, there doesn't seem to be anybody who has come up and said, "Yeah, we were doing the same thing." So, I think at the time, AATIP may have been the only program. Uh, it wasn't the only program forever, but during the time it was, a, it was, it was established, I, I think it was probably at the time, probably the only program going on, uh, but I, I could be wrong. Um, that's, that's just the best of my knowledge. We, we asked the question many, many times at the highest levels and uh, we never, we never received a, a response. From the moment you started, when was the first time you realized this is a real thing? Well, what case made you uh, convinced that you were dealing with something unknown, something that might be from earth, but could also be something that's not from this uh, planet. <laughs> yeah, the, it wasn't any particular case. Each one was compelling on its own, but it, it, it's not just one case. Um, every time we investigated a, 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 a case that was very compelling, it was usually followed by another one that was just as equally compelling or even more compelling um, because they're so different. E each one of these, there's some, there's some commonalities that we identified but there were also differences. And um, each one of them were, were, were unique to some degree and, and, and again, equally compelling. Can I ask what case stood out for you the most in your uh, career at a oh. Well, I can't talk about that one because <laughs> it hasn't been made public yet. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, yeah, uh, there, were, there were quite a few cases that were, were to me, very, very interesting and worthy of, uh, of further research and inquiry. Are you um, 
aware of any foreign uh, government uh, 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 having a, an agency working on the subject. Yes. Yeah. Were it multiple governments? <laughs> y yes, multiple governments. That's I know, cool. I know some were, were some were allied uh, to the U.S. Some were uh, some were adversarial to the United States. Yeah, I, I I know for a fact the French the Fre the French I think uh, they have a very open uh, uh, research uh, organization I think. So do the Russians? At least they did in the past. Yeah, uh, I have to be very careful what I what I what I say publicly about other countries' capabilities and intents. What I will say is that this is a topic that's 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 uh, of global concern. Um, it's not just the United States that's interested in this topic. There are other countries as well. And did you for, work together? For, uh, boy. Or maybe exchange you're information? Some, you're asking really good questions. Um, Sorry about let that. Let me <laughs> sidestep that. No, no, it's great. <laughs> Listen, it, it, I mean, you're asking fantastic questions. Unfortunately, some of these I have to be very careful because they're, they're, they're sensitive. And it's, it's like a child. Um, and with two divorced parents, um, you know, in order to get permission to, to watch TV, the child needs permission from both parents, not just one. So uh, for me to elaborate on what type of information sharing agreements existed uh, would, would probably not be prudent for me, uh, especially, you know, in light of the fact that maybe, maybe there are some countries that are still kind of sensitive to this topic. So I wouldn't want to put them in an in a, in a uncomfortable position by either confirming or denying their, their participation. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave it with a, with a polite pass and um, I'll... <laughs> Great question. Great question. Thank you. And I, I, I don't want you to compromise anything. Uh, uh, yeah, know. no, no, I appreciate it. I won't. I'm, I'm very careful not to do that. And again, your, your questions are, are phenomenal. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, I got some more. <laughs> My... Uh, uh, my friends, uh, Bram Rosa and Alex Griffioen, they run the uh, UFO hotline in Holland. It's basically a website. Whenever people uh, spot something, they can put it on their website uh, with a picture or maybe a, a film or just a, a, uh, a description. Um, but uh, they also have a map and, you know, you can see exactly where uh, people are making an uh, announcement they saw something. And in Holland, there is a very clear pattern. We have a couple of military uh, air bases and some known, but some uh, unknown. Let's say it's re restricted. <laughs> that, that, that's sure. where the, there's uh, nuclear weapons, right? So there's a very, you know, th those, those spots in Holland are actually like the red hot spots where, where there's the most activity, at least where people, you know, will, will uh, notice them. And there's one in particular, uh, it was Susterberg in the Cold War, the Americans stored um, nuclear uh, rockets there in, in, uh, in secret. It's, it was a uh, very uh, top secret. But there was the, the biggest case ever in Holland in 1979. Uh, a UAP showed up, the, the size of a football field, not making noise. And 13 Dutch military were witness to that. Also civilians in the area. Uh, now, uh, this is a clear pattern. Uh, are you aware of any UAP uh, activity in Holland? Uh, again, for the same reason that I, I want to respect the positions of uh, our, 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 our foreign allies, uh, I would never want to speak on behalf of, of the Dutch government. Um, but uh, I, I suspect if you poke around a little bit, um, there has been some some activity, certainly. Um, and, you know, you make a very interesting point about the connection between nuclear technology and UAP activity. That's a pattern that we continue to see repeated over and over again around the globe. Yeah. And I also talked to is Robert why. Salas. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know, he, Robert. Yeah, yeah, of but course. But, you know, that's not the only time that's happened. And furthermore, the uh, the folks on the other side of, the, of, of our pond uh, in Russia have had their own encounters as well uh, and involving uh, their nuclear technology. Again, I won't go into too much detail, but um, there, there seems to be a global pattern here. 
Yeah. And uh, clearly from, from a Dutch perspective or a U.S. perspective or even Russian perspective, you know, our, our nuclear technologies is often, often considered our crown jewels. Um, it, is a, it is a first line of deterrence uh, into all-out warfare. Um, whether we agree with it or not, the fact is that countries maintain these, these destructive devices to, to secure and ensure the peace, um, even though it may seem a little bit uh, contradictory at times. Um, that, is, uh, that is a philosophy that many countries have adopted. And if you have a technology that has the ability to interfere with that nuclear capability, then clearly um, that's going to be uh, that's going to raise some concern for a lot of countries, uh, and rightfully so. Definitely, um, it's it's extremely dangerous because it it doesn't even have to be uh, uh, someone's fault. Maybe there's like a uh, uh, you know the, something goes wrong technical technically. And you're talking about a nuclear weapon uh, and, and we're in big trouble. Um, I mean, well, let's put this in real terms of, let's say right now, the relationship between India and Pakistan, hmm. where they are on not such friendly terms. Imagine if a, a UAP were to interfere with one side's nuclear technology. And unfortunately, it's perceived as a provocation of war by the other side. Uh, you can see how dangerous that would be, right? Where right, right, we have yeah. one country have this some sort of UAP activity and it's misconstrued to be some sort of enemy attack. Uh, that's, that's very dangerous. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a very extreme, but, but potential scenario that we have to pay attention to. Yeah. Um, by the way, were you um, acquainted with the Dutch Susterberg case I, uh, from 1979? I, I, I am, I am aware of it. Yes. Okay, and then on a, on a let's say a top ten uh, worldwide case, w would it, would it be in the top ten? Um, you know, it depends on on your qualifications for ranking. Uh, are we talking about uh, the number of eyewitnesses, credible eyewitnesses? Are we talking about uh, the performance? Are we talking about uh, capabilities and intent? Or are we talking about, um, you know, uh, uh, its significance towards national security? Depends how you qualify that when you say top 10. Well, it's certainly let's significant. The, let's say the biggest you know, pound I, for pound case. <laughs> I mean, I would say also that, you know, the, the, the triangles uh, that were seen uh, as well in the 90s was a, was a fairly significant event over Europe. But there's been a lot that have never been... been been, that have come out and, and seen the light of day. Uh, there's, you know, it'd be very interesting. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to say much more than this, but, you know, it should be interesting to know what NATO has has seen over the years, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. And it, by the way, it was a triangle. <laughs> there was a decision to disclose um, the Fleur camp footage of, uh, you know, the, uh, some pilots, uh, David Fravor, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and some more. I have the, the other, one of the other names here too, the Commander... Underwood, I think. Jim Slate. Underwood. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's quite a few. But, not, okay, so in 2017, you, you uh, shared these images with uh, the New York Times, or the Pentagon did. Um, what and why uh, was the decision made to, to, you know, make the people aware of this, this is a real thing? Well, uh, I, I did not release the, the videos to the New York Times. That was that was somebody else. Um, I suspect, you know, the 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 purpose of it was to to gain increased public awareness of this topic and the seriousness of it. Um, unfortunately, the bureaucracy inside the government at the time was very restrictive and did not allow this certain information to get to the right people in the right places. So they could make an informed decision, and from a command control perspective, in the, in the, in, from a governmental perspective, that's a failure. That that's uh, the system is broken, um, and so the only way uh, to fix it sometimes is to to shed some light on the problem and do it in a way where you don't compromise sources and methods, you don't violate your your secrecy oath, but you still have a conversation, um, and. Uh, you know, maybe maybe increase the aperture for for greater transparency. Ultimately, this is a topic, in my opinion, that that 
uh, doesn't belong under the providence of any particular government or organization or institution or religion. It belongs to all of us equally. It involves humanity and it's a global issue. And uh, if that's the case, then why not, why not have a global discussion like we're doing right now? So this is a really, uh, I, I think, moving thing because this is going to change everything about man, mankind, what we ever, all we knew uh, is going to be totally different. Um, <clears throat> I, th I was wondering, is there maybe also a, uh, a, let's say, a reason to share this because there might be way more uh, encounters uh, coming uh, and we need to be prepared? Well, uh, you know, that's, that's a question that's often asked. Uh, why, why now? And uh, why this way? And my response is, why not now? Uh, you know, this is a discussion that I've said before is, is, is not like fine wine, where the longer you keep a cork on it, the better it gets. Um, I think this is a conversation that's a little bit like uh, old fruit or vegetables in the refrigerator. Um, and the longer it stays in the refrigerator, the more it stinks, it begins to rot. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, it's been quite a few decades that this fruit has been sitting in the refrigerator rotting. Uh, it's, it's not going to smell any better. Uh, we, we probably need to, to clean the fridge out, uh, refrigerator in my, my opinion. Uh, and so, uh, maybe this is a way to have the conversation begin, um, and, uh, allow people to digest the, the fact that um, these things are real, that, that UFOs, UAPs are real, without going to any preconceived conclusion of what it is or where it's from or what their intentions are, uh, we, have, we have still some way to go to answer those questions. First, we, we need to recognize the reality that these are real. And once we, 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 we recognize that as a people, as a society, then collectively we can have the conversation to determine what we want to do about it, if anything. Okay, and uh, okay, so we we're not saying it's extraterrestrial, <laughs> but we're not saying it's not. It is. It is highly. There's only three scenarios. It's either our technology here in the U.S., and uh, if so, then we've got some significant problems because we have failed time and time and time again to coordinate the testing of this exotic technology in and around our other our other capabilities. Uh, you have an entire, cap uh, an entire organization called the Joint Chiefs, <clears throat> where their job is to deconflict and make sure that we don't step on each other's toes. Uh, and certainly, if this is some sort of secret U.S. technology and we're flying it over major populated areas, uh, then it's not really so secret, is it? Um, you, what we do is if we have secret technology, we test it at places like Area 51, where people aren't going to see it. We don't test it over major metropolitan areas. Yeah. So that's or, one scenario. Yeah, or why... Why take out your own nuclear bombs? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Why take out your own nuclear bombs? Exactly. So, so the chances are very, very, very slim, very minimal that it's our technology. The other option is that it's foreign adversarial technology. And if that's the case, we, we have a bigger problem than we had before because now our national security apparatus, despite our very best intelligence and humans and SIGINT and ELINT and IMINT and all the different disciplines of intelligence have failed have failed to something to the scale of 9-11, of September 11th, where the organizations have been caught completely off guard by some sort of revolutionary technology that some adversary has developed. And by the way, they've had it for decades. And by the way, we have failed to report this to Congress. And by the way, we have failed to report this to the head of our intelligence community. And oh, by the way, we have failed to report this to the head of our Department of Defense, right, and national security. So there'd be a whole bunch of series of failures there that um, you know would, would certainly uh, put us at any disadvantage if, if we were to go into any type of real major conflict. The third option is that it's not our technology and it's not adversarial technology. Technology, It's, it's something else, completely different, something completely and totally separate from, from our own technology as, as, as a people. Um, and it's looking more and more probable that that may be the scenario, that may be the situation we're dealing with. We're dealing with a technology that is, is not necessarily human, perhaps. Sure. Um, how would you 
describe the pattern of behavior of these uh, uh, vehicles? Is it like uh, ob observant of, of whatever we do, you know, the military or, or uh, people? Is it um, uh, maybe aggressive, violent, or is it uh, maybe protective, trying to contain us for, from harming ourselves maybe? I think, uh, I think that's a question that um, if you ask anybody out there, you'll get different, different opinions. Um, at the end of the day, we simply don't know uh, whether it's good or bad uh, or, or, or something in between. The bottom line is that if this was a, 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 if these aircraft had a Russian star on the tail or a North Korean tail number, and they were flying over major U.S. populated cities, it would be a significant geopolitical issue. Uh, we would have hearings uh, um, on the Hill. We would have calls to action. We would, uh, it would be very provocative. Uh, in some cases, it could be considered an act of war, right? So, um, yeah. you know, from a national security perspective, I, I think we need to, to, to look at this for what it is. It's a capability well beyond anything that we currently have in our inventory, whose intent we haven't figured out yet. So for us, we, our presumption is that it could be a threat if it wanted to be. So we probably need to figure it out. Um, you know, as far as overt hostilities, well, again, it depends who you ask. If, if, if I come over to a particular country and I take their nuclear weapons offline, that's a pretty provocative act. You know, that's, that's not a friendly act. Uh, but then again, you know, if you are, uh, if you are somebody who is against, you know, nuclear proliferation then one could argue well they're actually doing it for our own good yeah um, but because when when my son plays with matches i'll i'll, I'll take it from him <laughs> sure right yeah and, and that's you know that's that's a that's a, that's that's good reasoning uh but typically when you take matches away from your son you explain to him why you're taking the matches away and and the dangers with it right you just don't take the matches out of his hand and not talk to him you explain to your son look These are dangerous. Look, if you play with these, you can burn the house down. You can hurt yourself. You can hurt other people. Um, we don't seem to see that. Uh, it's just, you know, taking matches out of people's hands. Yeah. And by the way, letting other people still have matches. So, I, I, again, I, I understand I, I'm not trying to sow fear into the hearts of anyone. Uh, I'm trying to be pragmatic. Um, you know, another instance is that there's a lot of people out there who claim that uh, they have had interaction with these things. In fact, there are some people, there's a subculture of people uh, that call themselves abductees or, or experiencers who claim to have had up close and, and personal contact with these things. And if that's the case, and they've been taken away from their own, uh, against their own free will, in my country, we call that kidnapping. That's a crime. Right. And furthermore, if, if, if I were to touch you against your free will, well, now that's assault. You know, that's, that's another crime. So uh, I, I, I find it very difficult to assume one way or another that it is or it is not a threat. So I prefer to presume that it could be if it wanted to be. So let's try to figure this out. DNA, has that been investigated to see if something is not human, not uh, maybe from, a, from an animal? Has, has there ever been DNA found that is unknown to us? Well, I think the premise of DNA is, is already, uh, we need to be careful when we say DNA, because DNA is, is a terrestrial thing. Living things, living organisms on this planet have DNA. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all life forms in the universe would have DNA to test, right? So or, or yeah. look, at a, look at a virus. A virus doesn't have DNA, but it has RNA. That virus replicates like a living thing. And it reproduces and it has a lot of the similarities and functions of survivability that a living thing has, but it has no DNA. It has RNA. And in fact, there's other living things that don't have DNA or RNA. So, you know, we, we have to be careful when we assume that everything is going to be playing by our rules, biologically speaking. I, I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. Yeah, of course. You know, it, it doesn't mean like, uh, in theory, other life forms have, have, the, have to have the same uh, uh, circumstances as we as humans have, you know, maybe they, they are uh, uh, accustomed to another totally different climate or, you know, maybe 
uh, can live without some things we cannot live uh, uh, without. Um, but is there some uh, maybe uh, equivalent to what DNA is to us you maybe have been investigating at the time? Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and, and pass on that question only because uh, I don't think the answer would be, um, be satisfying. Um, we looked at a lot of things in the early days, particularly under the OSAP umbrella of ATIP. Uh, we looked at a lot of things and a lot of things were, were, were very interesting, very compelling. But at the end of the day, uh, I can only speak on behalf of ATIP and my time in ATIP and my function in ATIP. And during my time at ATIP, our focus was primarily on the, the nuts and bolts of, of the UAP phenomenon. So we, we, we touched down on this a little bit just yet. Um, but why does the U.S. government make, um, in comparison to, to the past, such an uh, effort to make the, the, the people aware of this is something that, that is happening or going on right now and it might be real. Eh? So UAP, UAPs are definitely real. What they are might be extraterrestrial too. You know, we have to take that into account. You know, they want us to know this could be a real possibility. Why now and why not before? Well, I, I think that this is a conversation no one really wanted to have for a very long time. Uh, and again, going back to my analogy of rotten fruit in the refrigerator, um, I think it's, it's, it, it's becoming so apparent that the reality of UAPs is, is real, that the government now is in an interesting situation that the longer it keeps it secret, the more people will begin to distrust the government. Um, yeah. it, it is very important for, for people to trust their own government. When people lose faith and confidence in their government and their institutions, um, the end is usually near and for that, for that organization. And so I think there are people in the government that realize that um, as, as technology continues to proliferate and everybody now has a smart device in their hand, and, uh, it, it's becoming, um, the evidence is becoming overwhelming. And, yeah. and we probably need to have this conversation like yesterday, um, because what we don't want to do is be on the wrong side of history. We don't want to get to a point where we say these things aren't real. And all of a sudden, you know, you have a mass sighting where 300,000 people over, let's say, Los Angeles see something that, you know, is, is clearly not an F-18 or a helicopter or, or, or drone or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, we just talked about the behavior of the the object <laughs> um, but uh, I've, I've been talking to um, uh, James Fox and Jeremy Corbell and they gave me some information on these things don't seem to have any propulsion systems um, it, it doesn't have any action reaction device devices but it uh, and it taunts all rules of gra uh, gravity uh, we are we know of and uh, like David Traver described, it seems to be, uh, you know, like disappearing in a split second and popping up in that same second kilometers or, or miles away. Um, right. Is that speed or is that the bending of space and time? <laughs> uh, yes. Well, let's talk very briefly about the five observables. Five observables are the five fundamental characteristics that in ATIP we were able to solidify as being truly unique to UAPs versus anything else. The first is something we call instantaneous acceleration. Yeah. The, the ability to go from point A to point B in a very, very quick moment where the, the forces of acceleration are, are, are beyond what we, we currently can, can replicate. So what do I mean by that? Well, when I go from here to here very quickly, there are forces that are exerted and experienced, and we call those G-forces, forces of gravity. And to put that into context, the human being can withstand probably about nine, nine Gs, G-forces, for a very short period of time before we start having uh, negative uh, biological consequences like red outs, blackouts, and, and, and ultimately death, um, because it's the forces that are experienced by the body, the body's just not able to handle it. 
To contrast that to one of our most uh, maneuverable aircraft that we have, it's an older aircraft, but it's still one of our most highly maneuverable. <clears throat> it is the General Dynamics F-16 uh, aircraft, and we, we use them in NATO as well. And this is an aircraft that can pull probably between 17 and 18 Gs before the wings begin to, to fail. You have, you have structural failure. You have uh, the limitations of our material science to, to withstand these forces begin to, begin to break down. And uh, it, what we're seeing with these UFOs, in contrast to that, these things are being able to pull four, five, six, seven hundred, eight hundred Gs instantly. Um, so, so when you see a technology able to do that, um, it's certainly something well beyond anything we have. The second observable is hypersonic velocity. So let's take our airplane here again. Hypersonic velocities are those speeds that are defined by Mach 5 or above by definition. So the speed of sound times five plus. When you are traveling at that speed, there are all sorts of consequences and signatures associated with that. First of all, you have friction and heat ablation off the nose and off of the leading edges. You also have atmospheric ionization, which is the stripping of the electrons from the atmosphere. You also have contrails, visual signatures, uh, like, you know, if you will, the, the exhaust. And then, of course, you have acoustic signatures like sonic booms and sound. These things are able, in some cases, to travel not just Mach 5, but up to 13,000 miles an hour and do that in low atmosphere conditions where the air friction coefficients are, are very, very restricted. Uh, we have a very tough time. Uh, there's very few things we have in an inventory that can go Mach 5, um, let alone that speed. The third observable is a little bit of a uh, contradiction, but it's low observability. It's hard to see it with gun camera footage. It looks fuzzy. It's hard to see it with radar. We get these weird nonsensical returns. And even to the naked eye, you'll hear the people say, you know, I saw this object. It was metallic, but I can't describe it because it doesn't look like anything that we, we have at all. The fourth uh, observable is what we call transmedium travel, the ability to operate in multiple different environments without sacrificing performance characteristics. So to put this into perspective, an aircraft looks like an aircraft because it's designed to fly in our atmosphere. So it has a nose, it has a tail, it has a rudder, it has wings, elevators, ailerons to control itself. And then you have a, a jet engine. Whereas a rocket, which spends most of its time in a vacuum environment, you know, low earth orbit or, or higher, uh, doesn't use wings because there's no, there's no reason to, there's no atmosphere, there's no, you can't use a jet engine. So a rocket has thrusters and a rocket uses chemical engines to, 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 uh, to maneuver in, in those environments. And then a submarine looks like a submarine because it's designed to be underwater. And it neither looks like a plane or a rocket. In fact, it uses a propeller to mechanically displace water and it uses buoyancy to go up and down. And imagine now if you had a submarine that could fly and also go into space. Um, that's unusual. We as mankind, we do have some technologies that can operate in multiple domains, environments, but it's always a performance sacrifice. So what do I mean by that? Let's take a seaplane. A plane that can both fly and land on water. But when you look at a seaplane, it is neither a very good airplane, nor is it a very good boat uh, because it's a design compromise. And so the more environments you wanna operate in, the more of a compromise it becomes. Um, and yet these things that we're seeing uh, don't seem to have that, that compromise. So it's, it's a game changer. And then the last observable is, uh, as you say, uh, positive lift or anti-gravity. Now. There's only three fundamental ways we know how to defy the natural effects of Earth's gravity. One is through uh, balancing the forces of thrust, lift, drag, and weight. And when you do that, you can fly. You create lift and you fly. Yeah. Another way is through sheer ballistics. I can put enough energy, force equals mass times acceleration, and I can blast something out of a tube, like a mortar, like a rocket, like a firework, and blow it out of a tube. And then eventually what goes up comes back down. And the last way we know how to defy Earth's gravity, for the most part, is, is through buoyancy or lighter than air. So think of helium, think of hydrogen, think of hot air balloons, where the density inside that 
that compartment is less than outside and therefore it rises up kind of like oil on water but that's it um, and yet these things are able to defy our gravity without wings without control surfaces without uh, any type of obvious signs of propulsion so is the it, question is how are they yeah my, I, I have a little theory uh, maybe they're not defying gravity maybe they're using gravity because gravity is pulling us to, to earth it's a magnet right but if you like put two magnets to, uh, towards each other, you know, you can actually, it almost hovers basically, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, what if, what, if, what if it was even a little simpler than that? What if, if, if the ability to, can so what is gravity? Gravity is really a, a warping, of, as we now know oh. through, through Einstein. Excuse oh, me one that. second. I think uh, my wife just came home. I have to open the door. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure, <laughs> no worries. And in the meantime, folks, I'll tell you a little joke. How about that? What is the difference between in-laws and outlaws? Outlaws are usually wanted. Let's see if I have another joke for you. Sorry about that. Oh, <laughs> no worries, Max. I told your audience a little joke. <laughs> okay. I'll see that later. <laughs> okay. Um, um, so, so we, yeah, we well, had, you know, we're talking about gravity. So, you know, there were three fun, there, there's up, up until recently, there was only one fundamental model for, for, for science. And that was Newtonian science, where we all understand about gravity falling from the tree and force equals mass times acceleration and whatnot. Then last century along comes this guy named Einstein with the crazy hair. And he proposes the theory of relativity, where we now realize space and time are actually connected. They're not two different things. They're actually connected intimately and they're flexible. You can actually stretch space time. Uh, and then now over the last 30 years, four years, we have the introduction of quantum physics, which is yet another bizarre layer upon our reality, but yet it is, it is very true. And it explains the universe at the very small levels. And once uh, there was a gentleman who described uh, quantum physics this way, a dog walks into a box and out walks two cats. Doesn't make sense. And yet that's what we're seeing, uh, you know, from an from a observation perspective. We have, we have three types of science that are all true and correct. And when you look at gravity and what gravity is, we assume this is gravity. When I let the pen go, it falls. But that's not really gravity. That is a result of gravity. Gravity is really the warping of space-time. And that warping of space-time creates this, we can call it an attractive force, but it, it, it may not even be that at all. It may be something even much more bizarre. But, but for argument's sake, uh, if you had the ability to negate or neutralize the effects of Earth's gravity, in essence, pretend like Earth isn't even here, then the way you experience space-time would fundamentally be different than the way outside. So if you were able to successfully create a bubble around you right now in your studio and insulate yourself from the effects of Earth's gravity, a couple of things would happen. First of all, you wouldn't need wings or engines to float because gravity no longer affects you there. Secondly, it, you would have the ability to move around in space-time, but from the outside observer, I would see you performing things that seem to be unbelievably crazy. But in reality, for, from your perspective, you're just behaving normally. And I and everybody else outside your bubble is, is walking in slow motion. So it's, it's both are real but they're relative to each other. And so a lot of the, the observations we're seeing, the observables, may very well be uh, a result of someone or something has now the technology to manipulate the space-time construct in a localized area. And that is why we are able to see the five observables the way we do. Okay. Well, that was a very, very uh, educated uh, uh, <laughs> explanation. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. So I'm going to uh, ask you just one uh, last question. Um, and that is, of course, we have the, the, the 180 day ultimatum. Um, what, are you, what are your expectations on that? 
are we is there really something going to be disclosed to the general public or is it uh, going to be very disappointing <laughs> uh neither uh, i i'm very careful to manage expectations um you know first of all i don't think 180 days is long enough uh, to to provide a comprehensive report to congress uh, it takes longer in some cases to remodel someone's kitchen than it does to to provide this report so uh, i think um if if i was in charge for the day i would provide an interim report to congress as i expected and as they deserve. And then I would request a, an extension and, uh, and with a promise to, to provide a much more comprehensive report, do a very deep data call within the US government and our friends and our allies and, and, and provide a comprehensive report back to Congress uh, and, and probably, probably with a classified annex um, that will provide a lot of details to Congress uh, and then allow the American people to the greatest extent possible have access to the the information um, that we already have, um, as long as it doesn't compromise national security or or, or sources and methods. Of course. So uh, we know there's a new UAP task force at the moment, right? Um, mm -hmm. Have they ever approached you uh, for some intel, or maybe? Uh, I, I I can't go into that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't. Great again. Great question. You're asking <laughs> fantastic questions, but I. Uh, I'm not at liberty to discuss what, if any, relationship I might or might not have with, with elements I, of the U.S. And I completely respect that. Uh, and by the way, you know, if you, you know, want to disclose anything, I'm the guy. <laughs> 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 um, Very <okay>. good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let me see. Um, Mr. Elizondo, um, I think I'm out of questions. Uh, maybe you would want to... Max yeah. Let me, if I may say to you and your audience, first of all, sincerely and most heartfelt, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Also, let me, let me congratulate you for being on the right side of history. Oh, um, thank you, sir. I know this is a, a, an unpopular topic. Um, believe me, I, I, I get it. You're, you're, you're doing the right thing. Um, you know, there was a time when the church refused to look through Galileo's telescope. Uh, in order for him to prove that the earth was not the center of the solar system. And of course, Copernicus and whatnot, but um, change is tough. Change is tough. And it takes uh, the courage of people like you to, to have uh, a, an open and honest conversation uh, with your, your fellow citizens. And I want to, I want to tell you sincerely that um, I, I know it's not easy. And, uh, but I will tell you, you're absolutely doing the right thing. And, and that truth is coming out. And at hmm. some point, people are going to recognize that. And, and hopefully, they'll come back to you and, and thank you for, for your contributions. So on behalf of all of us uh, on the outside, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, thank you, sir, because, you know, um, you are, uh, you know, maybe the, the first person to actually have the courage uh, to really speak out. And, you know, I know you must have compromised a lot by doing that. Um, but thank you for that. You know, that's a big sacrifice. And, uh, you know, uh, I think I see it as my duty now, uh, you know, uh, to, to spread and educate uh, people uh, on this topic, even though I get some uh, abuse, but I don't mind, you know, that's, uh, you know, collateral damage, as you say. Sure. <laughs> Mr. Elizondo. Thank you. I've taken way too much of your time. And, uh, no, no, my pleasure. Thank you. It's been my honor and, and my privilege. Thank you so much, Max. Anytime you want to want to have a discussion, please let me know. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. And, uh, well, I hope to talk to you uh, sometime again. <laughs> you got it. Thank you. And have a good one. Take care. <laughs> you too. Take care. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If you like Fighting with Moskvich and you want to support my content, please subscribe and, uh, you know, I'll make more. <laughs>